moment, on this moment of your death, you will be punished with adab that is everlasting. You and I, alhamdulillah, who are solid in our faith, who are fulfilling of our ibadah, who are practicing of our sunnah, we have great hope. What is Abu Dharr's occupation? Why did they call him Abu Dharr the Ghifari? What is Ghifari? What was his occupation? He was an armor maker. Do you know armor? The soldiers they wear armor. In particular, Al Ghifar is the helmet that a person wears to battle. Because the head is the most important thing that needs to be protected. Istighfar, when you make istighfar, you're asking Allah to do what? To protect you. From what? From your self. And the mistakes you make unknowingly. Istighfar, it's not just, oh Allah, forgive me. Istighfar is, oh Allah, protect me from myself and the mistakes I make unknowingly. That's istighfar. And therefore the Prophet teaches us after ibadah, after salah, the Prophet would say, Assalamu alaikum, Assalamu alaikum, would say, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah, Astaghfirullah. And you would say, why is the Prophet making istighfar? Why does he teach us that we were doing namaz, we were praying, we were doing our salah. Why are we saying astaghfirullah? Because in your salah, your mind was the sister, she's praying uh, the biryani. I think I, the heat is too high. You know, the brother, he thinking, oh, you know, tomorrow traffic is going to be too much to get to work. I have to leave early, right? He's in Salatul Asr, but his brain is in his accounts, in his books, in this and that. So therefore, astaghfirullah, 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 to do what? Oh Allah, protect us. Oh Allah, shelter us. Oh Allah, forgive us from these distractions that we have in life. Tawbah, which is always linked to istighfar, they're always linked together. The Prophet says in Sahih al Bukhari, Inni atubu ilallahi wa astaghfirahu fil yawmi akthara min sab'ina marra. Every day and every night, every single day of his life, Muhammad, وسلم, he says, I make tawbah. And I make istighfar more than 70 times a day. What is the difference between tawbah and istighfar? Tawbah is the thing you know you do wrong. Something you know. I said this, I did this, I know I made a mistake. So therefore I have to atubu ilallah. I have to come back in repentance to Allah because I know I did it. Istighfar is for the things that we do not know, but we also must come back to Allah. Listen to this fear-inspiring hadith. In Sahih Muslim, the Prophet ﷺ, in Sahih Bukhari, the Prophet ﷺ says, A person may speak one word, and pay no attention to its significance. Not think it's something that's significant or of a or oh, it's, not, it's not a big thing, just something I said. لا يلقي لها بالا The individual does not think it is of any consequence or significance. فتهوى به في النار But that word, that sentence, that statement is what pulls them into the fire. Word. Aisha radiallahu anha, the wife of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu our mother, my mother, your mother in faith, Umm al-Mu'mineen Aisha radiallahu anha, one day she saw another one of the wives of the Prophet Safiya in a situation that was a little bit humorous. So Aisha, she says to the Prophet, Ya Rasulullah, unzur ila Safiya. Look at Safiya. Hasbuha kada wa kada. Look what she's doing, this or this. That's all she said. The Prophet wasallam's face became angry. And he turned to Aisha and he said, that's all she said. Look at Safiya, look how she looked at this, this or this. The Prophet says to her, Ya Aisha, innaki kulti kalima. You said one word. Law muzijat fi ma'il bahri la mazajat. If it was to be dipped in the ocean, it would pollute it. A word. 
Nothing, Aisha didn't think it's anything big. Look at Safiya. Right? Tawbah and istighfar. Istighfar is these things that we don't pay attention to. They're the mundane things that have become evil characteristics in our habits, in our life. Things that we say, things that we do that are wrong, but we may not be as aware of them. The Prophet actually tells us that he fears for us sins. Sins that creep upon us more silently than the footstep of an ant. You're unaware. So that is istighfar and that is tawbah. At tawbah wajibah, al Imam al Nawawi, he says, tawbah is compulsory. Min kulli ma'asiyah. Sagiriha wa kabiriha. It is a requirement for every error a person makes that they have identified as an error. Whether it's a major or a minor sin. If a person makes a mistake, there are three ways of clearing it. Awalan al ikla on al masiyah to stop. You know something's wrong? Stop. Second, an nadamu ala fi'aliha. To have sincere regret in one's heart that is measurable only by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. To have regret for having committed it. In the authentic hadith narrated by Imam Tirmidhi, the Prophet ﷺ says, An nadamu tawbah. Sincere regret is the essence of repentance. Third, Al Azm Allah Ta'uda ilayha Adbada. To have a sincere intention never to make that mistake again. Intention. Now I want to just pause for one second. One of the ideologies of the deviant sects in Islam, the Khawarij extremists, is their ideology that if a person makes a mistake and repents from it, if they do that mistake again, their first repentance is not accepted. Now that is not the ideology of the Muslim. As a Muslim, my, our belief in Allah the belief taught to us by the Prophet ﷺ, if you make a mistake, repent and are sincere in your repentance to Allah, even if years later, weeks later, months later, you make that mistake again, your initial repentance, if it was sincere, and if it was true with Allah, it is forgiven. Even if you were to make that mistake again. Could you imagine if every time you did something wrong and repented and did it again, it would keep adding up? None of us would have any security. And that part of the ideology, it's what makes people label other people kafir. They look at someone and they say, no, no, this person, he doesn't pray. Okay, he doesn't pray. We told him to pray. The person might be lazy. The person might be, you know, asi. He's a sinner. He believes in Allah, believes in his messenger Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam, but couldn't wake up for fajr. Didn't wake up for Fajr. Now if you say, okay, make tawbah the person, and then the next morning he forgets or doesn't wake up or is lazy again, that that person continues to have that, it is not from the ideology or the belief of Ahlul Sunnah. So that's a very important statement about tawbah. If you repent to Allah and stop committing the sin and intend not to make it again, even if you make it again, Allah has initially forgiven you. But more important is what if you do a sin that involves other people? These three things are about sins between you and Allah. But what if I, you know, here I am in Mumbai, I'm leaving tomorrow night. Just say I see something I like, I like the brother's watch. The brother goes to make his wudu, puts the watch and I take it. And I go to Perth, Australia. And years later, I say, Astaghfirullah. Oh Allah, forgive me. Now I don't know who the brother is. I don't know if he's now living somewhere. How am I going to find him in Mumbai? So what do I do? How do I fix an injustice inflicted upon someone else? If I am able to return it, I must. If I'm able to return it, if you've taken something and you know how to return it to the individual, you must return it. Even if you do it in a sneaky way, put it in the post, uh, put it under their door in the middle of the night, whatever. They don't have to know it was you. But if you can never identify them, it's very rare that you're going to find them again. The amount or the value of that item, 
you must donate it in charity on behalf of that individual. Now if they meet up with you all of a sudden, I'm doing Hajj, and I'm in Mecca, and I, you know, I took the brother's watch, it's maybe 10,000 rupiah, and I gave it in charity, I made repentance, and in, I've given it. And then he meets me in front of the black stone, and he says, ah, you took my watch. <laughs> I say, brother, I already gave charity. He goes, no, I want my watch. What must I do? To give him the amount that is fitting for his watch. So even if you give the charity, you still owe that person, right? So that is tawbah and that is istighfar. Shukr. Are we thankful to Allah? Like, are we truly thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the ni'mah that we have? For many of us, we have a great deal more blessings and benefits than others. You, you know, you might be sitting here, the person sitting next to you might be less fortunate than you. And Allah has honored you and blessed you in a way that maybe others might not have been. And those of you who, uh, who are with us here may be more fortunate than those outdoors, right? The fortune that we have, it's not because of yourself. It's not anything you do yourself. Do you really think that Bill Gates, you know, the owner of Microsoft, is so much more smart than Yahya Ibrahim that he can make one billion dollars a month because he's that much more smart and I cannot? It's not brains or intelligence or... Is he really that skilled that he deserves a billion dollars a month? That's how much his skill is worth? No. What is it? It is... Rizq. It could have been Bill Gates, it could have been Bill Richards, it could have been Yahya Ibrahim, it could have been anyone. But Allah chose to give rizq to whom? This person. Just like you sitting in front of me now, Allah chose to give you a certain amount of rizq. So you are fortunate. And as fortune is for you from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it might be more or less than others. It is not by anything you do, it's not by your skills or your smarts or your answer, nothing. It is Allah has given you a certain defined amount of rizq. You cannot increase it or in decrease it more than what Allah has written. But what Allah asks of you is shukr, thankfulness. I'll give you an example. In Perth, there's a, a freeway. Now, it might be a difficult example for you to understand here in Mumbai. Because your roads, you travel 20 kilometers an hour, right? When I'm talking about a freeway, I mean like, there's no cars around you. <laughs> you know, it's open road. And I'm on the Tonkin Highway, and it's a bridge that's over uh, the Swan River in Perth. And there's no emergency lanes, right? So if you're in trouble, you got to keep going until the end of the bridge. And it was late at night, and... I was driving home, I, it was just myself, my wife and the kids were at home. Maybe 11 o'clock at night, I can't remember where I was or what I was doing. And normally I don't wear contact lenses, normally I don't. But on that day it was very sunny and I put on my sunglasses, so I was wearing, you know, the little plastic contact lenses. And I was out all day and the contact lenses were in my eyes 13, 14 hours. And usually you shouldn't wear them more than 8 to 10 hours. So they began to get itchy and dry. So I'm driving, and I touch my left eye, and it falls. See, everyone, they know. You know if you wear contact lenses how much you need them. And I didn't have my glasses with me in the car. I left them at home. Put the contacts, I'm going to be home. Khalas. Touch my eye, the lens falls out. And of course, I'm traveling 120 kilometers. No, I'll say 100 kilometers. That's the speed limit, but I was going more. Traveling the speed limit because we're being recorded. And we arrive, I come to this bridge, I lose that lens. And all of a sudden your depth perception changes. So I'm trying to drive with one eye, you know. <laughs> and at the same time, I'm trying to make sure that the lens, that maybe it's on my shoulder, I don't want it to fall in the dark, where am I gonna find it? And I make it off the bridge. Alhamdulillah, six kilometers. And I turn on the light, and I'm looking, tearing the car apart. Where is this little piece of plastic? And subhanAllah, I find it. 
and it's got hair on it and dirt on it and I want to kiss it you know it's this little piece of plastic is so important to me to get home I still have 30 kilometers to go and it didn't matter to me eye infection or not I just shoved it in my eye and wallahi at that moment it dawned on me subhanallah you know it's not even something it's not even my own eyes it's not, it's not even my own self, it's not even the creation that I am. And look at how unthankful we are to what Allah has given us. That little piece of plastic became, you know, almost like life and death. Traveling at that speed, at that time, in the night. How am I going to get home? How often do we thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for the ni'mah that we have? And I'm talking about the ni'mah of a little piece of plastic. What about the ni'mah of movement, the ni'mah of health, the ni'mah of wealth, the ni'mah of success, the ni'mah of iman? You know, look at, at times the people who are involved in the shirk, who don't know Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the ni'mah of faith. How thankful are we for what we have? And therefore you hear these words of the Prophet ﷺ, narrated by an imam Muslim. Listen to these words of the Prophet. He says, لا يدخل الجنة أحد بعمله. Not a single person will enter Jannah, paradise, because they have done good deeds. You cannot worship Allah enough. You cannot fast enough, make salah enough, do enough good deeds in your life to earn Jannah. You, you'll never be able to come on the day of judgment. You come before Allah and you say, "I'm here." Where are my keys? You know, I know there's a home in there somewhere. Is, is that Jannah? <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, I'm ready. <laughs> oh, look, look, here's my book. Here, look, Salah. Siyam. <laughs> so it's all there. La. What about your health? What about the ni'mah? Do you actually worship Allah? Okay. Is your Salah, let's just look at Salah. Is your Salah enough? to cover the ni'mah of your eyes and hearing? Just your eyesight and hearing? Movement and mobility? Just salah, is it enough? These five daily prayers? La wallah. Your children, you, if your child falls ill, sick, the first thing, oh Allah, oh Allah, oh Allah, oh Allah, oh Allah, oh Allah, help, 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 help. You had your child well for 10 years. Now they fall sick. And now you say, Oh Allah, oh Allah, oh Allah, oh Allah, oh Allah. Where were you? 10 years of prosperity. Where is the shukr? Listen to the Prophet of Allah, Nuh. Why does Nuh make dua to Allah? Oh Allah, destroy all these disbelieving people. He says to them first, Nuh says, Ya qawm, my people, listen to me. Istaghfiru Rabbakum. Turn to Allah, ask Him for protection and help. Ask Him to protect you from yourself, from the sins you're making. Istaghfiru Rabbakum. Yursili sama'a alaykum midrara. Allah will bring the heavens and open them, open them with rain and barakah upon you. Wayumdidkum bi amwalin wa banin. And because of your faith in Allah, He will give you wealth and children. وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ جَنَّاتٍ وَيَجْعَلْ لَكُمْ أَنْهَارًا Allah will make gardens for you, rivers for you, everything you want. اِسْتَغْفِرُوا رَبَّكُمْ Be thankful to Allah. لَإِنْ شَكَرْتُمْ لَأَزِيدَنَّكُمْ Allah tells you in the Qur'an, if you continuously are thankful to me, I will increase you in what you already have. Shukr, thankfulness to Allah is three ways. The first important part of shukr is recognition of the ni'mah, is to recognize you've been given. Allah tells the Prophet Muhammad wasallam at the end of Surah Wadduha, Allah tells the Prophet, وَأَمَّا بِنِعْمَةِ رَبِّكَ the hadith. Therefore, when others question you or you're with others, declare to everyone around you the ni'mah you have been given by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Nowadays you meet a brother, sisters they meet each other. How are you sister Aisha? How are you uh, brother Ahmed? 
Alhamdulillah. <laughs> right? All of us. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Don't ask, don't ask, brother. Alhamdulillah. Leave it to Allah. Alhamdulillah. Allah will help. Do you know where we get this tradition? You know, you know how we say insha'Allah and alhamdulillah. Where do you get this tradition of alhamdulillah? They used to the Sahaba when they would come to one another, Kaifa Haluka, how is your condition today? When the person said Alhamdulillah, he was making what? Dua. He's saying, Oh, Alhamdulillah. How do we say it now? In the negative. Like they were saying it, you know, the Sahaba, they used to have one date for the whole day. How are you? Alhamdulillah. I have a date. We come now, we have everything. Alhamdulillah. The car, you know, it's the tire. <laughs> right? Uh, it needs more air or so. I don't know. I'll check it out. Alhamdulillah, alhamdulillah. Right? Shuk, recognize. They ask the Prophet, Allah tells you, Ya Rasulullah, Amma bi ni'mati rabbika fahadith. Therefore, declare Allah's ni'mah to others. What amount of ni'mah do then we have to begin to declare? Meaning, like, is it the ni'mah, oh, alhamdulillah, I got married. Okay, everyone, I got married. What is the ni'mah that then you have to tell others? Listen to the Prophet ﷺ, he says, If you've been given shelter and a cool drink to drink. It's ni'mah. A blessing from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Recognize Allah's favor upon us. Second, to use what we have in His obedience. To use what we have in His obedience. To be thankful to Allah, you if, you, if you have strength and health, use it in the capacity that is asked for by Allah. Obey Allah with it. And do not use your ability and the ni'mah in the disobedience of Allah. If you have wealth, use it for Allah. If you do not, be thankful to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do not use your ni'mah in that which opposes Allah and His Messenger Muhammad Wasallam. Third way of showing shukr is to be in the assistance of others. Muhammad Wasallam was profound in this, in how he showed others comfort, even though himself he needed to be comforted. People would come to the Prophet Wasallam and he'd be wearing a, a clothing. It was his only shirt, the only one he owned. And as he's walking in the street of Medina, a person comes and pulls the shirt from the shoulder of the Prophet ﷺ in such a, a harsh manner that it caused the Prophet's shoulder to bruise. And the Prophet turns around and he says, what do you want? The man says, I want your clothes. <laughs> I want your shirt, Ya Rasulullah. And the Sahaba, they come to this man, they say, you know Muhammad ﷺ, never does anyone ask him except he gives. Why do you have to ask the Prophet? It's the only shirt he has. And the man says, no, I want it. So the Prophet knocks on the door of Sa'ad ibn Ubadah, one of the people of Medina, of the Ansar. And he says, can I borrow something to wear? And Sa'ad says, yes, Ya Rasulullah, here you can wear this. The Prophet takes off his own clothes, borrows clothes to put on, and gives the man his shirt off his back. After the man receives it, he says to the Prophet, Wallahi, Ya Rasulullah, I only took this shirt so that I can be buried in it. So that when I die, my kafan will be this clothing of Muhammad So all of the sahaba who were then telling him, why? They're like, that's a good idea. <laughs> why didn't I think of this? <laughs> right? Shukr, thankfulness. Be in the service of others. This is to that extreme. Aisha and Anas and Ibn Umar, all of the sahaba when they would be asked, about the Prophet, they would say one of his distinguishing characteristics, Lam yus al an shay illa a'ta. Never was he asked for anything except he gave it. Anything. He was giving, sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And that is a way of being thankful to Allah Azza wa Jalla. <laughs> Oh